Hi, my name is Ted Kininjui, and here is our story about how we started Seed Balls Kenya. Um, so seed balls, uh, luckily, they're pretty self-explanatory. It's a seed inside of a ball of charcoal dust. Um, we use the charcoal dust because in the wild, nothing really eats charcoal, and that protects the seed uh, until the rain comes. And so you can distribute seed balls year-round. They'll sit there safe inside of the little ball of charcoal dust. When it rains hard enough, the charcoal washes away and the seed goes back to its natural state. So our journey with seed balls started in about 2016, 2017, but that was part of a longer journey of doing dry land afforestation. And we'd been doing a lot of tree planting since the late 1990s uh, with our family business, Cookswell Jikos, because we make energy saving stoves, but also realized for the need in the future, how do we grow more charcoal and firewood for a growing population, more people eating yamachoma, you know, we're going to need that charcoal in 10, 20, 50 years. So we'd been doing the traditional tree planting, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. You know, you dig a hole, uh, get a seedling in a plastic bag, plop it in, cover it up, start watering it. Um, our focus, though, had shifted towards when you think of where the charcoal in Kenya is mostly coming from, it's from dry land counties and it's mostly indigenous acacia trees. There had been a lot of discussion on how to plant like, you know, eucalyptus for electricity posts and this, that, the other. But there's very little knowledge and, uh, you know, actual, um, actual practical examples of people growing indigenous dry land acacia trees for biomass energy, for charcoal and firewood. So in the early 2000s, we went to all the experts we could think of and asked them, how do you grow a bag of charcoal? How long does it take? How much does it cost? What do you do? And you know, there's so much info out there. Some people said, you have to dig a hole two feet deep, a square hole. The other lady said, no, 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 a round hole. Some people said, trees don't grow in the drylands. We were like, but that's where the charcoal comes from. And those are the acacias that are being cut. How do you grow more of those? So we did all of those different tests over the years and we found roughly it costs about 150 shillings over 10 years to grow one acacia tree, grow it large enough for a bag of charcoal per tree by just pruning the branches without having to cut the whole thing down. But the seed ball light bulb sort of came about one time when we had a planting contract near Mololongo. And as many people who've done large tree planting projects are very familiar with, it can become a very trying um, affair of logistics. All of the things that start happening like it's finally raining so you want to get your seedlings to the field but all the roads are muddy and now your truck is stuck and you can't get you know all this stuff starts cropping up and happening which makes it more expensive to plant trees especially tens of thousands of them and so we had a little planting contract at someone's farm near Mololongo and I was you know doing that today buying a seedling for 20 shillings paying 10 bob to dig a hole uh, bringing in the manure you know watering the seedling and I looked on the side of the highway and these guys from the highway authority are busy slashing and clearing the side of the road. And one of the things they were doing was actually cutting down the same, same type of acacia zandofolia that I was paying someone to plant three meters away. So that kind of was the light bulb. I was thinking, wait a minute, if these trees are weeds to some people, how is it that I'm forcing it in a way to grow from a seedling in a plastic bag nonetheless? And you know, we're quite anti-plastic anyway. Um, that led me to thinking about, wait a minute, all these trees in Kenya from you know, time immemorial, who planted all of those? It wasn't people going around digging holes in straight lines one meter apart. That's not the wood that's been supplying Kenya's energy and building needs for the last hundred years. You know, this plantation forestry business is relatively recent when you look at landscapes and ecosystems here. So, you know, that thought in mind, I was like, if everyone, all these trees come naturally from seeds that fall in the right place, uh, we went to Kefri, the Kenya Forest Research Institute, bought a selection of different dryland seeds and went and just broadcast them in a tilled patch, a bare grass patch, so forth. Uh, came back, it was one of those years where the 
I think you'll remember the drought sort of around 2017 where the rains went uh, on point and realized almost all of those seeds had of course been eaten by birds and mice and ants and squirrels because indigenous tree seeds do provide a big source of food to many types of wildlife. Um, I wasn't able to be able to pay to feed all of the birds in Kajiado County. So we started thinking about how can we actually protect the seeds um, in a natural, you know, organic, non-toxic way, because you don't want to be putting chemicals out there, of course. And uh, then that helps leave those seeds in place until the rains come, because we know in dry lands, the rains are more funny timetables these days than they used to be. So we have an old business uh, friend, Elson Karstad from Chardas Limited. They're the company that started the briquetting industry in Kenya back in the early 90s, using that waste charcoal dust you see in the market, wherever they sell the charcoal. Basically about 10% of all of the charcoal that comes into Nairobi on a daily basis becomes those fines, little small dust. And if you do the calculations of, you know, two, three million people using a kilo of charcoal per day, it's a substantial amount. So he'd been a very, he's a very talented inventor and sort of, you know, machinist and stuff. So I approached him and said, could you come up with an idea? How can we start making these seed balls on a huge scale? Because when you look at the level of destructions, particularly for charcoal, for the Nyamachoma, for all the cooking, these areas need tens of tens of thousands of millions of seeds. And, you know, doing them by hand just won't cut it. The urgency is, you know, there. We're seeing floods and droughts more and more. So he invented a big machine that was able to turn out about a ton of seed balls a day. And so that's been opened up the whole sort of scaled reforestation, assisted reforestation. The reason why we use charcoal dust to coat the seed balls is twofold. First off, uh, charcoal is not eaten by many things in the wild, or at all really. Um, it's also very good for the soil. There's a whole movement now called biochar of using charcoal to amend degraded soils. Um, secondly, that's very interesting to us, is it's a kind of clo closing the cycle loop and process for Nairobi and Kenya's energy. So most of the charcoal dust we use uh, uh, we buy it from places where they sell charcoal and some of these piles are huge and, and we've actually found coins in the bottom of them from 1920. And so thinking about a tree that was cut down somewhere in Makueni, Narok, it was brought to Nairobi, became charcoal a hundred years ago, today almost, that this small seed ball could go back and plant a new tree for completing that whole sort of energy cycle is a very, very interesting point of all of that for us as well. Um, use waste to grow, grow for the future, you know. Once we've sort of finalized that tech, we went to the species choice. So that was very simple actually. We just said, because both of us being in the charcoal industry for a long time and knowing about it, we just said, what are the most popular trees that people are cutting down in Kitui, Isiolo, Narok, Ajiado? Which are those species that are being specifically targeted for charcoal making? And it's things like the Acacia tortilles, Acacia sayel, Acacia nilotica. So there's a selection that any good charcoal maker, or any good cook knows. It's really good quality, burns for a long time, smokeless. The thing is, that means those type of trees are being overexploited in the landscapes. And you can even see some areas like east of Savo. It looks very bushy, but it's all camifera. But you look at historical pictures and it used to be big acacia tortillas. So seed balls compared to how seedlings grow, it depends on the type of tree. You can't do seed balls from mangoes, of course, but generally for dry land indigenous canyon trees, none of them have ever been adapted to being transplanted and suffering transplant shock. So when you plant direct seeding, you get a tree with a stronger root system, which means it's more resilient to drought or goats and grows a lot stronger. And it's a lot cheaper. A seed ball's one shilling, a seedling can be 20, 50, 100 bob. So the uptake of seed balls has been fantastic in the last three or four years. It's really, I think it's a cross-cutting issue across all of society that deforestation is causing us big problems, floods, droughts, etc. Um, and whether it's been churches, mosques or temples, uh, cycling clubs, to air pilots and airplanes, to paragliders, to people on camels and donkey safaris, tourism partners. It's really been so interesting to see how many people have wanted to incorporate replanting more indigenous trees from seed on their own land, on public land, on the side of the road. But I think there's never been a more uh, interesting and more passionate drive among Kenyans to see the country become greener and more environmentally stable. So with seed balls being a new product, uh, of course, and a new, not a new concept per se of doing direct seeding rather than digging holes, 
Um, the challenges have of course been there. To me probably the biggest one is time, patience. Anything you do with forestry and tree planting takes a bit longer than growing tomatoes. You know, the results are not instant or overnight. Um, that's probably one of the prime challenges. Uh, the secondary thing is because it is quite a lot cheaper way of going about it, you sort of you know, disturb current markets a little bit. And people who are maybe selling seedlings, they really don't like to hear about the one shilling tree that our Kininjui's brought, you know. Um, so for us, our thought, and the way we've really overcome that has been focusing on dry land areas. And these are the places where charcoal is coming from. And although there's such a good tree growing and tree planting culture all over Kenya, most of it's focused in the highlands and not focused in these dry land areas where indigenous trees are cut for charcoal and firewood. Well, going forward, what's been so interesting is just the level of education we've even learned from ecological restoration is like we've now the last two years we've started doing grass seed balls and we're doing three different types of indigenous grasses that are typically overgrazed in area very palatable for livestock wildlife and stuff and so seeing the species diversification uh, people want to grow different trees for different reasons in different areas and then working very closely with Kenya Forestry Research Institute to get the right type of certified seeds and get them to the the right areas. Um, it's a huge, it's a huge country. I'm sure many people know that and it's very, very different, the ecology from the highlands to the lowlands and so on. And so it's an incredible learning process from us and from all of us who enjoy Nyamachoma, you know, it's an incredibly important thing to make sure there's going to be charcoal in the next 10, 20 years. My biggest thing would actually be to tell everyone is really try and spend time observing the area where you live and looking for natural regeneration. You know, go on walks with your kids or with your parents or your buddies, whatever, and really have a look and try and start identifying types of indigenous trees and identifying why are they being able to grow back by themselves and then think about how could you speed that process up. And I think one thing that's been so interesting for us and many of our partners is learning more about, you know, there are a thousand plus species of trees in Kenya and you ask many people, they'll name mangoes and avocado, non-indigenous ones, right, eucalyptus. And so using seed balls as a platform, I feel like for whether it's education for grown-ups to learn about the importance of biodiversity to the education of kids to learn about how much fun it is to shoot with a slingshot or something, um, our message to people would be Open your eyes, you know, and really listen and look around and get out in nature as much as you can. And you'll learn so much for all sorts of things for your own life beyond just tree planting. Really, really be observant of, you know, Kenya's wonderful natural heritage. And it will teach you an incredible amount. Uh, so that's our story about Seed Balls Kenya. Um, we're very curious to hear about what you are doing for the environment in Kenya. Please share your story.